Okay. All right. Here they come. Shall I get, shall I start? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to the third and final day of the Lawrence J. Schoenberg Symposium on Manuscripts in the Digital Age. Um, I'm Jesse Dummer, Digitization Project Coordinator for Cultural Heritage Computing at the Penn Libraries and a member of SIMS as well. And I'll be moderating the sessions for today. Um, I'd like to go over a few items of business before we get started. Um, first, in addition to our morning presentations and afternoon discussion panel, um, we'll also be having a coffee and or wine hour at 3.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time to celebrate and discuss the results of the transcription project to transcribe UPenn Codex 660, Le Pelerinage de Damoiselle Sapience. Uh, this hour will feature a discussion with Laura Moriali, who's been leading the project throughout the symposium. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to the chat um, where I'll ask Lynn to put links for today's program, as well as a link to the video presentations for the past two days from YouTube. Um, I want to remind everyone to mute their audio and vis video when the presentations start, if you haven't already. Um, each speaker will present for 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions. Um, as uh, we've done for the last two days, questions can be asked in the chat. And um, Nick Herman, who's our moderator of the questions today, will call on you once the question period has started. And if you'd like to, so if you'd like to ask the question yourself, you'll have the chance. Um, and if we don't get to your question in the 10 minutes that we have, um, we'll have more time in the afternoon during the discussion panel. Uh, we will be recording today's session and you can use the hashtag Sberg13 for social media. Um, before we get started, uh, Nick, I think uh, you wanted to say something about the Manuscript Studies Journal. That's right. So uh, thanks, Jesse. Um, as uh, Lynn mentioned yesterday, uh, the, uh, our uh, journal, the Sims Journal, Manuscript Studies, uh, we've just published uh, volume 5-2, and we are uh, working on uh, the following volumes. And so we uh, encourage all of you to think about submitting articles. We accept articles, uh, full articles uh, that are sent out for peer review. Uh, and we also accept shorter annotations, uh, which are uh, non-peer reviewed, uh, generally under 4,000 words. And these can uh, be published relatively rapidly. So we publish two issues of the journal a year in print and online. Uh, and it's a great journal. Uh, we encourage you to, uh, to send content to it. And also, uh, we publish book reviews. And Amy Hutchins is our book reviews editor. So if you uh, are working on a book project and you'd like it to be reviewed, also please get in touch. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, so today we have another timely topic for the age of COVID-19. Uh, symposium participants have likely spent a lot of time online during the pandemic using digital interfaces and interacting with digital images and metadata through these interfaces. So today on the last day of the symposium, our speakers will explore the topic Interrogating Interfaces and Digital Representation, Images, Metadata, Screens. Um, first up, we have two speakers from the Getty Research Institute, Alicia Maria Hautrau and Kim Richter. Alicia Maria Hautrau is a Senior Project Manager at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. She currently manages two research projects with digital outcomes, the Florentine Codex Initiative and the Pre-Hispanic Art Provenance Initiative, which provide new insights on indigenous art and cultural heritage of Mesoamerica. In her previous position as a senior content producer at the Getty Research Institute, she specialized in content development for digital art history projects and exhibitions and produced multimedia and scholarly resources that showcased objects online and in the gallery. She is interested in how digital media transcends physical barriers to facilitate the study of art and cultural heritage through collaboration and knowledge dissemination. Alicia's background is in Latin American studies focusing on art history. She received her master's degree from UCLA where she researched pre-Columbian and colonial art of Mexico and Peru. And uh, presenting along with her is Dr. Kim N. Richter, 
a sen uh, K Dr. Kim N. Richter is Senior Research Specialist in the Dire Director's Office at the Getty Research Institute. She received her PhD in Art History at the University of California, Los Angeles, specializing in pre-Columbian art and archaeology. She is author of numerous articles on Huastec art, co-editor of the Huasteca, Culture, History, and Interregional Exchange, co-curator of Golden Kingdoms, Luxury and Legacy in the Ancient Americas, and co-editor of the award-winning accompanying Golden Kingdoms catalog. Her current collaborative digital initiative focuses on the Florentine Codex, an encyclopedic manuscript about Mexica life and culture created in 16th century Mexico. Um, and they will both be presenting on the Florence, the Florentine Codex initiative today. So please welcome them. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, Alicia and I want to especially thank Lynn Ransom for inviting us to this wonderful symposium that has already been so enriching. And we really look forward to the panel and discussion with you all uh, later today. Now, before I begin, and I've heard this uh, a number of times um, uh, yesterday and the uh, in, the, in the previous uh, symposium days. So I, we, we put a disclaimer on ours as well. Um, we also are in the middle of the, we're in the thick of things in terms of data generation and technical development, design, et cetera. So please consider all we show you today as a work in progress. Um, so I'm the PI on the initiative and Alicia is the project manager. So let me begin by sharing my screen. <clears throat> so to Mesoamerican scholars like myself, the Florentine Codex is one of the most important manuscripts as met Mary Miller, our director at the research in once put it, it's the Encyclopedia Britannica of pre-Hispanic and early colonial Mexico. To introduce you to this codex, I begin very, with a very simplified biography. The codex was created between 1575 and 77 in Mexico City at the Real Colegio de Santa Cruz de Tlatelolco, though compiling the information took 30 years. It was written and painted collaboratively by Spanish friar Bernardino de Sahagún and a team of indigenous Nahuatl grammarian scribes and painters. Although Sagun is usually credited as the sole author, we know the names of a handful of these Nahuatl authors and artists, many of whom were trained by Sagun at the college in Tlatelolco. And here I'm naming some of the names that we do know. The codex was sent to Europe shortly after completion and was acquired before 1587 by the Medici family. Today, the manuscript continues to be housed in the Biblioteca Medicea Laurenziana in Florence, Italy. Sagun's work, including the Codex, was inscribed in UNESCO's Memory of the World Register in 2015, and our initiative started in 2016. Our initiative has been funded by the Siever Institute, the Getty Research Institute, and since 2019, by the Getty Trust via a major new initiative called Ancient Worlds Now. Although the Florentine Codex technically falls outside the temporal range of ancient, since it was created during the Renaissance period, it does document archeological cultures of Mesoamerica, including the succession of Mexica rulers and cultures that predated the Aztec empire. So while it's not ancient, the Codex is an important source for ancient cultures of Mesoamerica, for many of which we have otherwise no textual documentation. As our colleague Diana Magaloni has pointed out, the Florentine Codex was painted in the middle of an epidemic between 1575 and 77, which disrupted supply chains of colorants. As a result, some of the images in the last two books went unfinished. But the Codex also documents earlier waves of epidemics, one in 1520, and you see an image of the 1520 uh, epidemic outbreak, which contributed to the fall of Tenochtitlan, the Mexica capital, AKA the ones in charge of the Aztec empire, and another in 1545. Millions of indigenous people died over the course of the 16th century as a result of these current waves of epidemics. Um, 
Sahagun comments on the disastrous effects of the epidemic. Many people died either directly from the illness or indirectly because no one was there to care for the sick. Of course, these words from the past are especially poignant to us today uh, since we're living through our own pandemic. The Florentine Codex has 12 illuminated books amounting to about 2,500 pages. It is a bilingual encyclopedic document with two column of texts, Spanish on the left, Nahuatl on the right. The content and structure is modeled on Roman and medieval encyclopedia such as Pliny's Natural History. Here's an example of how this encyclopedic information is captured in the codex, both in the two texts and through the images. The images mainly appear in the Spanish column and are based on the Nahuatl text, which seems to have been written first. We see on these pages in book 11, the book about nature, how each paragraph of the Nahuatl text starts off with a term referring to the particular type of creature, followed by a description and paired with an image uh, in the Spanish column. Again, this landscape is rendered with an impressionistic wash of pigments, whereas the artist carefully provides the necessary details uh, to identify the insects. The top left image shows the pipiolti bee paired with a flower, which instead of being depicted growing from the lush meadow is represented as a scientific specimen, uprooted, floating, in the foreground and showing all stages of bloom. And here I'm thinking of Daniela Bleichmar's research on scientific illustrations in the Americas, and this is a very early example of that. The Mimiwat bee lives in the hot lands, indicated here by a radiant sun. In contrast to these highly Europeanized images, the painting on the Xicalpapalot includes an indigenous cultural element, a gourd bowl, from which the butterfly seems to emerge. The artist deliberately included the gourd bowl as a pictographic sign that indicates the butterfly's specific name. The Nawa text explains, quote, its name comes from the shikali, meaning gourd bowl, and papalot, meaning butterfly, because it is yellow. It is quite yellow. It is fuzzy, end quote. We see how the artist self-consciously and deliberately drew on both European and pre-Hispanic artistic strategies to convey indigenous knowledge and to create their own transcultural visual language. Because the images provide such critical information in addition to the two alphabetic texts, our colleague Kevin Terraciano has proposed that the images should be considered a third text. Our initiative has four outcomes. The Digital Florentine Codex or DFC as we call it, uh, uniting the newly digitized codex with its translations and transcriptions. Uh, also, we are creating 4,000 multilingual entries contributed to the Getty vocabularies in English, Spanish, Classical Nahuatl, and Contemporary Eastern Huasteca Nahuatl. A uh, digital publication fo focusing on Book 12, A History of the Conquest of Mexico, as well as K-12 lesson plans on the conquest of Mexico, contrasting indigenous and European perspectives. And now I turn it over to Alicia, who will tell you more about the Digital Florentine Codex. Thanks, Kim. So we'll start this section off with a photo of Kim's desk to illustrate just how challenging it is to work with the Florentine Codex. Unless you're a paleographer who reads 16th century classical Nahuatl and Spanish, you have to consult numerous separate translations and transcriptions just to read the Codex. With the exception of the pricey, though magnificent, facsimile, all of these publications are partial in one way or another. For example, many don't include the over 2,000 illuminations contained in the manuscript, or if they do, they are decontextualized and extracted in a separate section of plates. Finding concordance is difficult and time-consuming, and that's assuming you even have access to all these print publications in the first place. What we aim to do with the Digital Florentine Codex, or DFC, is to bring these numerous texts and the digitized codex together, making all parts of it accessible to scholars, students, and the public. So what you are seeing here is absolutely not a final design. It's just a wireframe. And I'm hesitant to even show it as we haven't yet entered the design phase. 
nonetheless, uh, this basic mock-up of the website helps us to envision how we may present the information, which is why I'm sharing it with you today. Uh, basic features of the website will include the ability to zoom in on details, turn pages, navigate directly to a specific uh, book, chapter, folio, perform keyword searches for text passages and illuminations, download JPEGs at 150 DPI, uh, also uh, download preformatted citations, read about the project, uh, the codex, and link to related resources. And perhaps the most evident and significant feature is that we will utilize a viewer that permits the simultaneous juxtaposition of text and images. And uh, so here in the next slide, we have just another wireframe to show you that for book 12 only, we are also including voice recordings of the classical Nahuatl column of text read aloud and also uh, contemporary Nahuatl summaries. This additional content is aimed primarily at contemporary indigenous Nahuatl audiences as Nahuatl remains the most widely spoken indigenous language in Mexico with approximately 1.5 million speakers. And we owe this valuable contribution to Eduardo de la Cruz Cruz, a native Nahuatl speaker, language instructor, and the uh, director of the Nahuatl Language Institute, IDEAS in uh, Zacatecas. So as you can see, this digital edition aims to be a very comprehensive source for the Florentine Codex. And the viewer that will support this functionality of juxtaposing texts with the digitized manuscript is Canvas Panel. This customizable IIIF viewer is being developed and tailored to this project by Digirati, uh, an outside agency and software company that specializes in cultural heritage and digital humanities. Currently, we anticipate launching the DFC by the end of June 2022. So here you can see uh, an overview of the transcriptions and translations that will be made available in this enhanced digital edition. We are including, uh, as you can see, many already published translations and transcriptions and are also producing original translations. Leon Garcia Garagarza is translating the Spanish text to English and our colleagues at UNAM, Berenice Alcanta and Federico Navarrete will translate the Nahuatl text of book 12 to Spanish. We are also including contemporary summaries of the Eastern uh, Huasteca Nahuatl for each of the uh, 41 chapters of the Codex and the audio of the classical Nahuatl for book 12, as I previously mentioned. So all of these texts are being digitized, uh, meaning we scanned the published texts, ran optical character recognition, and corrected and edited them as needed. And we are now in the process of extracting the text at the folio level and putting them into a plain text format with basic markup, as you can see here, uh, to indicate headings and footnotes, et cetera. And this is being done uh, for each folio of the codex. So another outcome is to contribute 4,000 multilingual entries to the Getty vocabularies drawn from the images and texts of the codex. Each image in the DFC will be tagged with these terms making the search possible. To that end, our team of experts, Alana radlo Zur, Berenice Gaillemont, and Rebecca Dufendor, describe each of the relevant keywords in classical Nahuatl, then translate them into other languages and compile the necessary data to contribute them to the Getty vocabularies, which I'll speak more about shortly. And Eduardo de la Cruz Cruz is providing the contemporary Nahuatl translations. So these multilingual entries will be made freely available as linked open data via the Getty Vocabularies databases. And, and now, because the illuminations provide information that goes beyond the written texts and represent visual elements that are not necessarily named, this tagging of images will allow researchers to find relevant content more readily. Nahuatl is also an agglutinative language complicating the search for individual words. For example, the next slide, if the user were to search the term esquintly, dog, they would not find it in the transcribed text 
because the root of the term is altered by its possessive prefix and plural suffix. However, if they search the illuminations for Isquintli, they will find these examples here and more uh, where a dog is depicted. And with the multilingual search, they will find it whether they search dog in English, Spanish, contemporary, or classical Nahuatl. And similarly, the codex is replete with visual references to weapons of war uh, or military insignia. However, elements of the Spaniards' weapons and armor for which there are equivalent terms in Nahuatl created in the 16th century are not named in the written text. The images, in contrast, depict an array of costumes, firearms, guns, and crossbows. Our multidisciplinary team uh, with expertise in art history, history, ethnography, Spanish, and Nahuatl describe iconographic and stylistic details of each image with uh, key words. As you can see, tagging uh, allows access to the language of the visual third text that Kim was describing earlier. And here's just one example of the variety of vocabulary applied to a single image, starting with the description of the landscapes, the characters, animals, uh, but also adding dates, names of the clothing, equipment related to horses, and the different weapons. So ultimately, this is what a complete entry looks like in the Getty vocabularies. The entries for each term come with a definition and a source, and very importantly, they capture the variant orthography, which is so prevalent in 16th century Nahuatl. And building on Diana Magaloni's pioneering research, the vocabs team together with Jeanette Peterson has also begun a project to identify the hand of the artists that painted the images and of the scribes who penned the text. So far, they've identified 10 hands in the 161 images of book 12 and three scribal hands. The goal is to tag the images and the text by artist and scribe so one could search all the images or texts rendered in a single hand. These unnamed artists will thus be recognized and their made up names will be contributed to the Getty vocabularies, much like unnamed uh, artists of Greek bases are identified. And uh, so now I'm going to turn this back over to Kim. Thanks. So the third outcome is a digital publication focusing on book 12, which provides the longest surviving Nahuatl narrative of the conquest of Mexico. And here I'm showing you the first few pages of the book documenting the arrival of Spaniards in 1519 and a key event, the Toshcat massacre that took place the following year. This version, version largely contests the dominant Spanish perspective, which is heavily based on the writings of Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conqueror. Book 12 is especially fascinating because it features the greatest discrepancy between Spanish and Nahuatl texts and images. As you can see in this example, the Spanish text in the left column is greatly reduced or completely replaced by images, which often support the Nahuatl texts but also provide critical and subversive information that could not be spelled out otherwise in writing. One example is Moctezuma's death. In the Spanish version, the ruler is killed by his own people because they saw him as a coward and a traitor. Whereas this image makes clear that he was assassinated by the Spaniards and then tossed in the canal alongside a ruler from a neighboring city. Because this topic of regicide was so sensitive the Nahuatl text only alludes to the Spanish culpability, whereas the image uh, leaves no doubt. Here, the Nahuatl text paired with the images in Book 12 present an alter alternative account of the conquest and forcefully counter the official Spanish narrative that has come down to us in history. The images in this book document historical events, including many battles, as well as, import as, well as important moments of indigenous resistance personified here by these glorious, powerful Nahua warriors. Taken on their own, the images tell a compelling version of events. When we isolate them from the text and string them together, which we plan to do for the digital publication, they remind us that in pre-Hispanic codices, historical narratives were recorded through images, not alphabetic texts. It is therefore no surprise that images are central to this bicultural manuscript. 
who accompany this digital publication, we are in the process of developing K through 12 lesson plans on the subject of the conquest of Mexico, which is very much still taught from the European perspective, um, which is currently, um, and this summer we collaborated with UCLA's Latin American Institute in the organization of K through 12 teachers workshop, which aimed at introducing teachers from the LA Unified uh, School District to primary sources that document indigenous historical narratives about the conquest, such as book 12 of the Florentine Codex. Because the event had to go virtual due to the pandemic, we were able to invite 17 experts from across the US and Mexico to give talks to the teachers. And usually the speakers are only local. The teachers then worked on developing lesson plans that digest the scholarly information. This example prompts students to compare the depiction of the death of Moctezuma in a European painting to that of the Nawa image in the Florentine Codex and to express what is at stake when history is told from divergent vantage points. We aim to publish these lesson plans online and make them freely available. All this work is being accomplished by an exceptional team of colleagues, which includes local and international scholars and staff in different departments across the Getty. We are indebted to their invaluable intellectual and technical contributions. The initiative likewise would not be possible without the support of institutional collaborators, key among them the Biblioteca Medicea Laurenciana who allowed us to digitize the manuscript and gave us permission to use the images. Thank you so much. Great, so thank you so much, Alicia and Kim. Uh, what a fascinating manuscript and uh, impressive project to bring together uh, the translations, transcriptions, and um, digital images. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nick now. Um, I think we have a couple questions already in the chat, and everybody feel free to um, put your questions in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, thanks uh, to the speakers, and thanks, uh, Jesse. Um, uh, we have one question from Barbara Williams uh, Ellertson. Um, Barbara, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Certainly, thank you. I'm uh, very intrigued by the um, example of searching for dogs in the art and wanted to ask you how those searches are conducted. Are there human applied tags or is it a pattern recognition algorithm? Uh, human labor involved in everything. <laughs> so this oh, is why yeah. we have such a, a great team, yeah. So they are meticulously going through each and every image, describing it, then it gets put into the Getty vocabs, and then the images are um, sort of, once they're in the viewer, they will be, you know, in the back, on the back end, tagged with each of these terms. Wow. And again, that will also, because they're in the Getty vocabs and we are capturing the variant spellings, you can, again, no matter how you're searching the term and no matter what spelling, well, we're, we're capturing the most common relevant uh, version. So, my example is always Moctezuma is spelled just in the codex alone, like seven or eight different ways. And then in modern times, we've added a couple more. So, um, so you know, you will want to find um, each instance, no matter how it's spelled in the codex or however you spell it. And so that will really allow people to bring up um, all the relevant hits, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Liza Mardoyan. Lisa, do you want to unmute and ask ask your question? Otherwise, uh, we can maybe read it out. Uh, of course. Um, thank you, Alicia and Kim. This was wonderful. Uh, I was just wondering for the image search, the word search, uh, if somebody doesn't, do you need to search every word, sword, or if you just put weapons or armor or any variation, would that result in all the images that capture uh, uh, a list, an array of weaponry. Yeah, so the team in, so in the one image that Alicia showed you with that frontispiece where they had all the images, they had, so they go from really broad and then get um, increasingly more specific. And also the, the Getty vocabularies are, they're a structured hierarchy. So the hierarchy also will be reflected in, on the back end of the search. Right. And of course, you know, the, the tricky thing with describing these images is, you know, they're, they're, our team, they're, they're very, um, 
you know, knowledgeable and they're trying to think of all the possible ways, you know, to a certain degree, at some point it will be limited, you know, like you might be able to think of that one thing that they didn't describe, but they're being pretty thorough. So. And this also includes uh, things like artistic technique. So if you want to look for maybe a wash or, um, you know, something like that, that will also be included. That's the goal. And do we have any other questions for our speakers? Of course, we can follow up with questions later. Uh, we have one uh, from uh, Nancy Turner. Nancy, if you want to uh, unmute and ask your question. Hi, Kim. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Hi, Congratulations. I just wondered, you know, for, for this image recognition, um, had you explored using some kind of computer recognition uh, software rather than armies of people doing iconographic word, word keywords? No, not really, because um, the image recognition is sort of the easy part, right? It's the uh, attributing the metadata. I think that's the the tricky the tricky component and doing that multilingually. So we didn't really explore, you know, image recognition. And it's like it's also very specific, you know, like iconography. That's um, you know, so so we didn't we didn't explore that at all. Yeah, Thank imagine you. trying to do the toponyms. Yeah, it, yeah. It seems Although like the toponyms very... might have been the easy, the easiest component because they're relatively standardized, but um, yeah. As, also, uh, and, and also, as we heard yesterday, it's sort of this this topic of metadata and authoritative sources is one that's uh, really it's sort of the unglamorous, sexy part of this project, you know, to outsiders. Um, but to us, that's really the, 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 the meat of it. Um, and so this is, I think, where we are making an important contribution. And by also contributing them to the Getty vocabularies, there's sort of um, sort of a creation of metadata that will be available beyond our project, which I think is something we're really um, keen and interested on. In. We have a question from uh, Bill Andrews. I just want to say what an absolute amazing project. I really love it. And the, the scope and the work is just incredible. And as, as scholars always do, we can always think of something else that would be cool to throw in here. And I was really curious because I've worked so much with textures, what the textures of the pages were like and the pigments on them. What kind of, it always, when I see textures, I get a sense of the pigments and what they might be. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, I got to see the, the the manuscript once for a short time and got to hold it in my hands. Um, and I think the the most amazing thing for these um, codices, um, at least for, for our pre-Hispanic and early colonial codices, is when they do exist in facsimiles and reproductions, even if they're the best reproductions out there, um, they're always sort of like, the color is never quite right. And mm -hmm. I'm always shocked and I remember this on numerous occasions, also when I've seen the um, Codex Mendoza or pre-Hispanic codices, is just how the image, how the color pops and it looks so fresh. It looks like it was painted yesterday. And, and usually the sort of the, the facsimile are sort of a little bit yellowed. Um, and then here they're like these like bright, vibrant images. And there's been a lot of work that's been done on identifying um, colorants and pigments um, and minerals in these codices. So Diana Magaloni has, you know, been uh, done amazing research and published extensively on the colors in the Florentine Codex. Um, and others have done, uh, there's a great um, team um, in Italy that's been studying a lot of these codices and they've been going to different places, MoLab and um, and so there's a lot of knowledge there um, and th that's already been published. And so we didn't really include that in, in our project here. We really want to make it accessible um, in sort of 
the, and, and bring together this concept of the three texts. But, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, you know, we had lots of additional ideas and like, we sort of like keep wanting to do additional things. And at some point I also just said, you know, like if we do all this, then we will never finish. So we have to really restrict ourselves. And sometimes I sort of think, are we really even restricting ourselves? It's like so crazy in a way, the amount of data that we're handling uh, and the amount of texts um, that, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a huge project already. And so like, I, there's a lot more ideas um, and we just kept saying, no, no, no. We just have to stick to this really, the, we're driven by this concept of the three texts and bringing the images together because the images typically haven't been explored quite as much. You know, there's, you know, in, I'm an art historian. So art historians, of course, go, have gone in and studied particular images and, and thought about them, but then they typically might not look at them in conjunction with a text or they might just look at the English translation of the Nahuatl, but then not look at the Spanish text. And really the magic happens when you look at the images with the two texts together, because they're just, you know, people have always described the, the Spanish as a translation, which seems like it's a direct translation one-to-one -one, and it's not, we've been calling it an interpretation because it really deviates in some ways sometimes dramatically from the um, Nawa text. And so this is why for us, it was really so important to bring the images back into conversation and focus on bringing um, sort of these three texts together. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and to Alicia and Kim for your responses as well. I think in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the um, second speaker, but um, Please do bring your questions to the discussion panel this afternoon where we can explore yeah, this thank more. Thank you everybody for great questions. Um, so our second speaker is um, Johanna Green. Dr. Johanna Green is lecturer in information studies at the University of Glasgow and co-director of the Glasgow-wide Digital Cultural Heritage Arts Lab. She specializes in book history and digital humanities uh, Johanna's in research interests are in the history of text technologies focusing on the manuscript, early printed book, and digital page as material object and cultural artifact, and the development and use of digital technologies for the elucidation of historical texts and documents. Johanna has digital humanities, textual editing, and manuscript studies experience, working with a range of interdisciplinary research projects in both Europe and the United States. Um, and today she'll be presenting um, on remote code ecology, navigating the material book at a distance. Um, so thank you, Johanna, and um, welcome. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen with you folks, and then we can get going. There it is, fantastic. So greetings to everybody from a very cold and rainy Scotland. Turns out even in a pandemic, some things still say the same. Um, I'm going to begin my presentation, if I may, with a memory. Um, the last conference presentation that I gave to a manuscript studies audience was back in May of 2018. And I began that presentation by thinking back to my first ever manuscript experience. And the reason I did this is that I presumed that my first ever manuscript encounter would have been an undergrad in our uni special collections with an in inverted commas an example of the real thing. But it turns out my first ever manuscript encounter actually came five years before this, way back in the year 2000, when I was about 16 or 17 years old. And that manuscript was digital. It was a CD-ROM copy of the Lindisfarne Gospels turning the pages. And as someone who grew up in the northeast of England, and my parents' house is about five minutes drive away from St Peter's Church in Weymouth, this is a manuscript that's known to many of us. And my parents had obviously somehow managed to get hold of a copy of the book for us to look at. Now today we might look at, back at this 20 year old technology and acknowledge its limitations, the unnatural shape and speed of the page as it's being turned. And from what I remember to be the Star Trek door-like um, artificial swoosh of the pages that sounded as you moved them. The reason that I began my 2018 presentation with this memory and the reason that I do so again now is that for me back then in the year 2000, I had no awareness that this wasn't how a manuscript handled and this wasn't how a manuscript sounded. To me, in that moment, 
I wasn't looking at a surrogate or a remediation or an avatar. I was looking at the real thing in my dining room with my parents on a housing estate in the north of England. And if I'm totally honest, I don't think I really cared that any of those things were artificial because I didn't realize that they were. I kind of just thought it was cool. I think about that experience a lot now that researching and teaching digital manuscripts is what I do for a living. And I do this because, as I've said in other presentations and publications, a lot of our early conversations about digitized manuscripts is centered around this issue of sensory engagement and loss. We talked a lot about what the digital didn't do. And those arguments are absolutely valid because of course, we can't feel the hair or flesh side of a digital manuscript. We can't hear the sound it makes as we turn its pages, unless it's been augmented with artificial sound. We don't comprehend the bumpy topography of a folio. We don't easily understand the size or heft of a manuscript when we meet it digitally because our digital manuscripts, they're not surrogates. They're their own objects with their own limits and limitations, with their own physicality and materiality, and with their own opportunities for sensory engagement. I've always had a bit of an issue with the perhaps old fashioned or traditional argument or presumption that we absolutely need to have hands-on access to a manuscript in order to truly understand it. To me, that feels a little bit elitist and ableist and it overlooks huge audience groups who will always be materially disenfranchised from our collections, and yet they have equal rights to access and understand them. This was brought into sharp focus for me recently. As someone who was diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer back in 2018, one of the side effects of my chemotherapy was peripheral neuropathy. My hands burned and peeled, meaning I lost my fingerprints, and my nerves were damaged, meaning the permanent feeling of pins and needles, the inability to confidently pick up and hold objects, to type or to write, or as it happens, to feel the textures of any surface. Imagine my horror when I eventually returned to work, skipped up to our special collections reading room to handle my first post-treatment manuscript. Not only could I no longer feel the texture of the parchment or binding, I couldn't confidently lift the codex. I couldn't feel the edges of the folios to securely turn the pages. Here I was, someone with the privilege of being able to have this so-called perfect, necessary in-person manuscript handling experience, and I couldn't feel a damn thing. Now that many of us are working remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdowns, and I speak very much from a city that is from today about to go into full lockdown once again, these issues of sensory engagement take on renewed relevance. When I use a digital manuscript, it forms part of my research process. It helps me prepare to examine a manuscript in the flesh. It augments and confirms that in-person experience after the fact. It's a place I can easily check and recheck details I'm referring to in my work. When I was dealing with my neuropathy, the digital provided me with a comfortable and accessible means of, excuse me, uh, of working with manuscripts without handling the issues I faced in the reading room. And to cite an idea of Angie Bennett's, the digital manuscript acted as prosthesis for me during this time. But for me, like many of those early commenters on digital manuscripts, our digital images only go so far. Because as a book historian, as someone whose work centers around how we make the fleshy wholeness or plenty text of a manuscript digitally accessible to multiple audiences, 2D digitization fails to communicate the entire codex as a 3D object. And I echo, echo many other speakers this week and also paraphrase Elaine Trahan's work when I say that. When I look at a digital image, I always do so knowing that I will at some point probably need to see the real thing. Our mass digitizations have done what our manuscript catalogues traditionally did. They prioritize textual scholarship, access to the page, to the text over the object. Exceptions to this rule obviously apply. Bill Ender's 3D images of the St. Chad Gospels for one, Dot Porter's Vizcol for another, along with many, many other examples like the Great Parchment Book Project, or even the imaging of the recently discovered 2,600 locked letters contained in a 17th century trunk donated to the Dutch Postal Museum, which allowed them to be read without their locked material form being destroyed. Or let's be honest, any of the amazing examples we've looked at this week during presentations. 
They all show what can be learned when we undertake deep or slow digitization over mass. But in the main, our approach to mass digitization has been to make text available first. Frustrating as this is for the book historian, this approach becomes further complicated by the remote working 2020 has brought with it. For once, no one can access easily our collections. All we have is the digital. For me, this raises a number of questions that I'd like to explore today. How are we accessing the material codex in this pandemic, if indeed we are at all? Where is that material information held? Have our views of the digital and the role it plays in our teaching and research changed over the past nine months? What, if anything, can we learn from our remote working situations for the future of communicating material codex digitally? And given that most of us remain at a distance from our collections, for those of us who do some, have some physical access, I'll talk about that in a minute, how can we work to create additional access to the material codex? I'd like to start by looking more closely at my distinction between mass and deep digitization to ask where exactly the material codex exists digitally. And by di material codex, I here refer to both the physicality of the manuscript objects in our collections and the material experiences of our bodies when we interact with the physical object. While Wednesday's presentations demonstrated how mass digitization approaches are beginning to shift to include images of the foredge, head, foot, spine of a manuscript, in the main, if we're looking to access information on the material codex as a 3D object, we're likely not heading to mass digitization images. We're heading to deep or slow digitization projects, those that are making use of new tools and approaches to answer specific questions about a specific item or collection of items. And as phenomenal as those resources are, we have the same issue as we do with mass digitization. The digital outputs represent but a small percentage of our total collections, and of those, even a smaller number are concerned with those issues of digitally communicating the medieval book. We knew this before the pandemic, we know it now, only now we really truly feel it, I think. So if any of you have been like me, you'll have been looking around for other possible places to get your material kicks, thinking outside of the box, taking a step back and wondering where else we might find evidence of our material collections. I found this evidence in two places. The first is my own personal image library of manuscripts I've previously worked with. Let's be honest, we all do it, don't we? If we've had limited time with an item, or we need to reference uh, an image of something within a manuscript that the digitized image doesn't provide, permissions willing, we whip out our smartphone and snap a few arty pics. We may even capture a video or two. We capture the weird and wonderful angles that we ourselves find ourselves in when we're examining a manuscript in person. And I can't be the only one here to suffer from permanent manuscript backache. I collect these images for a number of reasons, for research, to help provide additional visual points of entry once I'm back home writing up my findings. For teaching, to be able to include a wider range of items into the classes that I teach. And for outreach, and it's this last point that has contributed mostly to my own personal image library, bringing me to the second place I found material evidence. Up until my diagnosis in 2018, I regularly posted items from Glasgow's archives and special collections to Instagram making a point of communicating the very things 2D digitization or traditional physical manuscript exhibitions obscure, using macro photography to explore pigments and inks, producing video flyovers of pages to communicate a folio's topography and shifting materiality as one plays with movement and light. The close-ups of manuscript headbands, pore marks, pricking and annotation, all of those wonderful things that make up the guts of a book that quite a lot of folks never ever get to see. This practice of collecting images for public engagement on social media forced me to explore Glasgow's collections further than I might have traditionally done for teaching and research. But the result is that now, in this current remote working lockdown pandemic, I'm kind of sitting on a gold mine of images of those collections, and most of them are things that haven't been professionally digitized. Of course, the potential of these personal collections for access and research is nothing new. We only have to look at the DIY digitization project at Oxford to see that. But while my images are sat here in Glasgow on an external hard drive, many of them are available to you in some form on Instagram. 
In fact, if we're to find a wide range of materially focused images anywhere online right now that isn't bound up within specific projects, it's probably on collections and researchers' social media feeds. What's fascinating to me about this issue of personal image libraries is that these are perhaps the resources few of us have thought to turn to during the pandemic. We tend not to treat social media as source material. We don't typically cite it in our work, even if it was the source of our initial access to our knowledge of a manuscript. And the work that goes into curating a collection's social media feed has long been acknowledged as being under-resourced, underfunded, and undervalued. Only few collections have dedicated social media staff. For most collections, that role is tacked on to an already very demanding job. We don't connect our social media content to our item catalogues. Our posts in the main aren't prioritized for digital preservation. They're seen as edutainment rather than research and teaching resources. To make a connection to one of the lightning talks from this very conference, Chris Burney's talk opened up the conversation of the role social media can play in, DIY, in making DIY images of undigitized manuscripts. And I'd like to pick up on a point he makes in his talk. Of his own iPhone images of the manuscript in question, Chris says his images are not aesthetically helpful because they haven't been captured under controlled conditions. While I completely get where Chris is coming from here, I don't think he should be so modest. On the contrary, the informality of those images has the potential to contain huge amounts of information about those objects that traditional digitization might have obscured. But here's a question. In the case of the manuscript Chris focuses on, sold on the private market and not digitized out with his own images, given none of us could now easily have access to the original even before the pandemic, would we still view his social media images as a remediation or have they fact become the primary resource for that manuscript. Given we're all in lockdown and all we have is digital images, how are we viewing any of our digital manuscripts? Because I'd argue they've all had a promotion. No longer are they the additional resource to an original item. They are in fact the only thing we've got. If no one can access the book stacks, folks, do the real manuscripts even exist? Given the potential for these informal images and social media sites, to serve our material needs when working remotely, will this or should this change the ways in which we produce, consume and cite digital manuscripts and social media posts in the future? To bring my talk to a close today, I'd like to further reflect on the role social media content of manuscripts has played for me during the pandemic. I spoke at the beginning about issues of access during lockdown. Many people have said, including during this conference, that well, access is all the same for us now, but I don't think it really is, is it? Because it's still one that's massively based on privilege. The privilege to have Wi-Fi, the privilege to have a computer, the privilege to know where digital, digital resources exist um, that could help us, and the privilege to cite, given the ocular centricity of our digital manuscripts. And I kind of hate to confess this to you folks, but a number of us still do, in fact, have physical access to our collections, even in the highest lockdown restrictions. But it's not for research, it's for teaching. To explain a little further, today Glasgow into, goes into the Scottish tier four lockdown, essentially just like lockdown back in March, except the schools and universities remain open. At Glasgow Uni, this means our main library is open to students with distancing measures. But the reading room of our archives and special collections is now closed for research. It is, however, still open to those of us who are teaching with collections, which includes me. Which brings me to my second myth buster, that digitization has stopped during lockdown. Because once again, I'm here to tell you, I don't think it really has. And the reason once again is teaching. The reason that I talk about this here is that my primary concern this year wasn't how do I access the material codex for my research needs? Because I'm gonna be honest, hardly any research is getting done right now. But how on earth do I provide access to it for my students when I'm teaching remotely? And this conversation began early on in lockdown for me here in Scotland, because as a lecturer in information studies, I typically deliver over 50 five zero contact hours of archives and special collections item handling teaching across our two semesters. While I'd argue that object-based learning is important across many disciplines, 
For a number of our programmes, this handling is absolutely essential. One such example is our postgraduate master's programme in information management and preservation, which is duly accredited by SILIP and ARA. In short, we train archivists. Learning to confidently handle a range of materials forms a centre of that teaching that can't and shouldn't be easily replaced. Learning how the material vehicle informs the message encoded within a record, something that's augmented by the handling experience, equally can't be easily replaced. We need to think quickly about how this teaching could be delivered in a way that was safe for staff, safe for the collections and meaningful to students. Our solution was to invest in the same over-the-shoulder technology that Dot Porter has so wonderfully put to use at Penn, using it to pre-record handling orientations and to deliver live sessions over Zoom. For us, our camera wasn't needed for small specialist classes, but for large numbers of students. My own class this semester has nearly 50 postgraduate master's students, and my colleague in economic and social history, Hannah Louise Clark, recently used the kit to deliver a live class using archival materials to over 500 undergrad students at once. So where does social media come into this? Well, for me, this issue of digital materiality isn't simply a question of where does materiality already exist digitally and how do I get to it remotely, but how can I make materiality exist digitally when we're working remotely? While the virtual classroom, collections classroom technology offers me the means to communicate and connect to students to items in our collections, it doesn't mean that the, the content will be meaningful. We still run the risk of providing a flat 2D access, given the camera points downwards from the ceiling, in the same viewpoint that digitises our medieval manuscripts. <clears throat> we still run the risk of delivering these items of a lecture, Here's me, I have the information, here's a book and I'm regurgitating it to you. I mean, that's fine. It's not exactly exciting, is it? And it doesn't involve the digital delivery of the material manuscript. My work in photographing items for social media taught me that in order for our digital assets to have value, they need to be deployed meaningfully. They need to involve the audience in the content being shared. The audience needs to feel they have autonomy over what they're seeing. In my classes, our live Zoom sessions have been supplemented by video orientations, by DIY images and videos taken by me on my phone, and further supplemented by brand new full digitizations of manuscripts and archival records being produced for the items I teach with. And then in our live sessions, I'm not simply talking through an item on camera while students watch, but I'm taking the sessions and making them interactive. With 50 students based across the globe to include, this isn't an easy task. I can't easily ask them to all call out answers or to shout for me to show them something of interest, but I can put them in the driving seat. And the way that I've done that is to use Zoom's poll feature, making my lessons a choose your own ending style class, where a series of pre-designed polls, students decide things like, what supports should I use to handle a particular item? Which pages should we look at first? whether I pause or zoom in to a particular um, place on a, on a folio, on a page. We use Zoom's chat for them to ask questions which are fed back to me by my colleague. And of course, the whole thing is recorded for them to rewatch later. And the result is that students are accessing handling training remotely. They're taking control of their remote um, manuscript encounter. The items on show become sites of active material engagement. They're engaged and invested in what we're looking at because they voted for it. And their voices, opinions, and questions are heard in a space they hadn't expected them to be able to be heard. And the feedback has been resoundingly positive. They want classes to be longer. They're thrilled the sessions are interactive and they're excited that the technology is helping bring them into spaces they can't physically access to material experiences they thought they would be without. The labor involved in producing these resources is really heavy but it brings with it other benefits. Glasgow has a world-class manuscript collection, but currently does not yet have a manuscript viewer for those items which are digitized. That work is ongoing. So for teaching, this is a major problem. It's all very well me collecting these images and making these videos. But how on earth do I share them with our students? Our virtual learning environment, Moodle, really can't cope with 600 TIFF images being uploaded for every class, along with my images and videos. 
I also can't depend or expect students to download huge files to their own computers simply to access teaching content. The solution has been to create individual manuscript collections on a university EdShare platform, available for the sharing of educational resources with specific university communities. The platform has a preview function built in, and the items can be downloaded direct or opened in a browser to view. And most importantly, I have curatorial control over what and how I organize my images and videos, meaning I now have a way to make my personal library of images available alongside the professionally digitized counterparts. And this isn't a medieval manuscript uh, clocked, it's an 18th century um, item, but I couldn't help but share it because I used it in teaching this week and I think it's glorious. Our manuscripts essentially are beginning to tell their 3D story. Each collection can be accessed via a stable URL, which I can embed anywhere. There is no reason that until the day Glasgow has a manuscript viewer in place, that these collections couldn't be added to our manuscript catalogue simply by including the link. What I'm saying is, is that vast amounts of manuscript images and information are actually being produced right now, um, and certainly at Glasgow. But as a community, we need to think critically about the role and value these resources can and will play for our continued digital access to manuscripts, for teaching, research and public access. We can create material access at a distance. We are creating material access at a distance. And we have an opportunity here, not just to stop and think about why we have digitized in the ways that we do, but how else we have been and are continuing to capture items in our collections. Perhaps it's time we moved on from treating personal image libraries and collection social media image content as digital ephemera and instead start to see them as key sources of primary information. On Wednesday, Lisa Fagan Davis made the excellent point that the journey of the codex through time includes through its transformations as digital manifestations. This hasn't stopped with a pandemic. The work that I've described today captures the journey of some of Glasgow's manuscripts in the time of the pandemic. It tells a story about what we needed to do in response to lockdown and how we dealt with the challenges and limitations of our existing resources and systems. We shouldn't ignore it. Just like the dirt or doodles in the margins of our man on manuscripts that we research, our digital responses to our manuscripts tell the story of what those items mean to us now. It adds to their lived biographies. Our manuscripts might have also experienced lockdown, but they aren't locked up. If we look more closely, we'll find we're surrounded by the material codex in the digital realm more often than we thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Johanna, for your insights into seeking out the material codex during the pandemic and um, your thoughts on um, how ableism and privilege affect <laughs> access and how we interact with manuscripts. Um, and also asking us to think about what we're producing during this time right now. Um, so I'm going to turn the um, question moderation over to Nick now. Um, so if you have any questions for Johanna, please enter them in the chat. Um, no questions yet. I, I, we're, uh, I see we're running a little bit uh, behind on time, but um, that was such a fascinating talk, uh, Johanna, with so much, uh, you know, so much content and so so many, so many observations on teaching in this in this particular moment um it looks like alexandra maybe has a question uh oh yes right um alexandra alvis has a question. alexandra do you want to do you want to um un, un, go ahead and unmute and ask the question or should... sure hi joanna i miss you so hi, much <laughs> Uh, I, this has been such a wonderful opportunity to sort of have a, a big manuscript family reunion with everyone. Um, it's been so nice to hear and see everybody, um, but I wanted to uh, specifically ask for your comment um, on the Folger Library's new reference image collection, uh, in which they added images quickly snapped by librarians to their quote unquote official image uh, collection on Luna. Mm -hmm. um, specifically sort of about the, the sort of canonization of images um, when they become official on, on the library's website versus mm -hmm. when they just live on your phone or 
or on an external hard drive or something like that mm -hmm. or even on social media yeah thanks Ali it's a really great question I'm, I'm really pleased to see that this has happened to be honest because I think so much work goes into collecting these images whether it is for social media or for personal use that perhaps the audience at the other end only sees one or two snaps of so to see that labour recognised, I think is really important. Um, from a material point of view, I think it's particularly important that we collect these items together because as I said, they provide completely different information than a standard 2D digitization. Um, I think one of the things that I'm really keen to um, communicate here is that the labour that goes into producing our digitised images needs to be cited, but so does the labour that goes into uh, producing these DIY images needs to be cited as well. Um, so I think that by bringing those images together in this reference collection, we actually have that kind of visibility and recognition. Um, but I'd be interested to see what other people think about what we should be doing when we're citing that material. Um, Uh, and we have time maybe just uh, for one more question. I see Nancy Turner has a question. Hi again. Uh, loved your presentation, Joanna. Um, I wanted to ask you about what you think of sort of what I consider the call the Pinterest effect. Like when you go to Google a manuscript, even when you have the shelf mark, the library, the first thing that comes up is not the BNF or BL website, but Pinterest. And that means you have to join Pinterest and then you get spammed continuously into an inbox. Um, so I'm just wondering, I, I do so appreciate that your comment uh, and especially on the, the video about the um, incidental digitization. I do think this is so important, but um, what, how, how, for it, when you're dealing with this, this aggregator like Pinterest, that's a for-profit company. Are we to cite Pinterest? You know, I'd rather cite Nick Herman's Instagram than that. But anyway, <laughs> I'd like to hear your so, comments. Thank I you. completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with you that we need to concentrate what we cite on the people who have done the labor rather than the places that host it. Although obviously we need also need to communicate how we've come at those items in the first place, because I would argue that even something like Instagram or Pinterest comes with its own materiality around it. So it affects the way we engage with the images that are embedded in there. Um, but I think we're perhaps missing a little bit of a trick with things like Pinterest, because we do have the ability with that particular platform to embed links, to link those items back to our catalogs and drive that attention from social media back to the resources that we've plowed a lot of time and money into. And at the moment for me, I mean, I spend a lot of my time figuring out how can I make the experience that I have in special collections open to everybody? Like, how can I explain this to my parents what this is like? Because they're never gonna have that experience. And that's what social media helps me do. It helps me bridge that gap. Um, but I think that we could really do with more information about what our audiences think of the items that we produce on social media, why they're consuming it, what they're looking for. Does it happen by happenstance? Are they looking for specific content? And what does it mean to them? I mean, I've, I've said in, in previous articles, you know, I think the ways in which we, we present images on social media can have a huge impact on the way folks engage with those images and the haptic engagement with those images. But I don't know that for sure. It's a theory. Um, you know, are the things that I think are valuable actually valuable to the audience? And is, are there other things that we're not doing that public audiences would really like us to do? We don't really have a lot of information on that. Um, so I'd like to see us as a community really thinking more about that um, because I think we could drive a lot of use and attention to our funded resources from social media. And I think we're missing that. Thank you for these uh, questions. Um, I think, uh, Jesse, if I'm looking at the time, I think it's time to, to move on. So um, sure. thank you, uh, Joanna. And thank you for everyone who asked uh, questions. Um, okay, thanks, Nick. Um, our third and final presenter today is Bill Endress. 
Bill Endress specializes in advanced imaging techniques and manuscripts. He is author of Digitizing Medieval Manuscripts, The St. Chad Gospels, Materiality, Recoveries, and Representation in 2D and 3D, Arc Humanities Press 2019. Using a number of imaging and post-processing techniques, Bill has digitized the 8th century St. Chad Gospels and presented the results on the web through interactive 3D renderings. A viewer for reflectance transformation imaging and stacked and comparable multi-spectral and digitized historical photographs. Bill teaches and researches at the University of Oklahoma and is currently working with the University of Oklahoma Library to develop a robust virtual reality environment for studying and teaching manuscripts. In his spare time, he hits golf balls for Luna, his young brown Labrador who is obsessed with chasing them. Um, and today he'll be uh, presenting a manuscript wanders into VR, oh my. Um, so welcome, Bill. Ah, thank you. And the dog literally is addicted to playing golf. Uh, just absolutely amazing. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about VR and manuscripts, and I want to thank the Schoenberg and Lynn and everybody, uh, Jesse, for all your work putting this conference together. It is I think one of the best conferences uh, that occurs every year and I'm always disappointed when I can't attend. So it's really nice to be able to do it this way. Also, I get to say uh, good morning to everybody in the Americas and I can say good afternoon to everybody in Europe. Um, Zoom is probably the only time at a conference we can actually do that. Uh, so I wanna talk about VR in part because the price of equipment is dropping so rapidly but also the quality is becoming more and more impressive, but mainly because of the affordances of VR for engaging manuscripts digitally. Uh, there's also another compelling uh, benefit. It invites reflection and awareness on materiality, materiality of manuscripts, and the materiality of the body and our relationships between the two, which I think is really important to think about. I think once we kind of develop a certain way of going about doing our work, we stop reflecting upon how we're doing our work. We just try to get it done more and more efficient. I'll start, however, I had to sneak this in for Joanne. Uh, this is my little artsy photograph of the Hereford Gospels, which is a manuscript I dearly love. And if I need to kind of grin at myself, this is one of the images I go to. Um, <coughs> I want to start with the far side. Um, and here we've got uh, hooting excitedly, primitive scientists uh, Thack and Gork wander into Times Square trying out their new time log. We all need a time log. And in many ways, manuscripts do operate as time logs. Um, unfortunately, as a time log, they can't bring the artists and scribes with them. However, they do miraculously bring uh, medieval artistic skill, thoughts, feelings, knowledge, aesthetics, and DNA, and other things. Uh, I think we've had an interesting conversation. We had a little bit of it this morning, but earlier on Wednesday about primary sources uh, and whether images are primary sources or not. I tend to think about it phenomenal, excuse me, phenomenal, phenomenology, I'm trying to turn phenomenology into an adjective and my tongue isn't twisting around it quite right. But in thinking about it from the phenomenon, um, the manuscript itself is the primary source. However, if I think about it from a user source, the images that I'm using are my primary source. So I think it is kind of this difference in perspective I like to think about uh, digital images as witnesses. And so we can talk about this more in question and answers. And I think that, again, depending upon perspective, it's almost like we need another name for digital images. Time travel is a superpower or excess of mediated experience, which is really fabulous because our manuscripts, when we bring them into our reality today, you know, we've got a 10 by 14 
piece of medieval history. They have to compete with things like IMAX movies. I love Caesar's eyes there. So we need to kind of be able to translate that experience into uh, today's mediated experiences. One of the ways that the digital does it wonderfully is through magnification. And I dearly love magnification. You can see such details and you can see how they can jump off the screen. And even when we start looking at pigments, we can really see how it's deteriorating. And, and there's beauty in these micro views or these magnified views that are really important. <laughs> Here's the St. Chad Gospels pulled into VR. And suddenly my manuscript can be as big as an IMAX movie. These pages are blown up to the size of a building and they can translate for students that wonder that actually they had in medieval times because they didn't have to compete with IMAX movies and they were really these magnificent things. Um, Protagoras says man is the uh, measure of all things. And I wanted to alter uh, Michelangelo's image just slightly so we could honor uh, women here as well. This is actually, I was gonna say, this is the original version of this Michelangelo sketch, but uh, I did alter it, so I'm no Michelangelo. But our human body is the measure when we go and encounter a manuscript. Now, one of the interesting things about it is Aristotle's uh, categorization of five senses we've carried forward with us. However, humans have 22 to 33 senses, depending upon uh, how precise your definition is. Our most dominant senses are normally sight, hearing, and touch. However, we have other ones like sense of balance, which we have the canals in our ears, that allows us to keep balance, proprioception, so we know where the parts of our bodies are at all times, sobriety tests, close your eyes, touch your nose, um, proprioception, and the kinesthetic sense moving forward. So one of the things also that's important about our senses is that they work together so that the brain is taking all this sensory data from 22 to 33 senses and putting it together. We experience that when we type. If you try to type on a typewriter or even a keyboard and don't have the sound that allows you to know that you've completed a key, it can throw you off a little bit because you're never certain where you are in the stroke. You're either pushing too hard or not hard enough. Now, the other thing about our senses is that they have different sensitivities. The eye can actually discern 0.2 millimeters at approximately 25 centimeters if you have 20-20 vision. However, if we play with touch, touch can actually discern something that's 13 nanometers. So our touch is actually 1,500 times I had to do this math about five times to make sure I got it right. Uh, more sensitive than our eyes, which is really pretty incredible. This opens possibilities for us. Um, there's a company uh, doing research or based on research at the University of Bristol's that are generating haptics through ultrasound. So literally they can project midair a geometric object and we can feel it with our hands, which is why fascinating and wonderful. So we can translate physical material and the materiality of something into different means, which opens up possibilities. Also, we can actually change sensory input. Oculus hand controllers allow for 250 different intensities of vibration. So what we could do is actually take a page of a manuscript and translate color into different vibrations. We could also do sides, we could use the textures into different vibrations, which, which would magically and wonderfully open up possibilities 
uh, for seeing impaired people to experience manuscripts, something that is denied to them. One of the things that I find so important about scholars getting involved in technologies like VR early is so that we can push on these possibilities. And if we can push on VR to be more inclusive and not only think about able-bodied people, we can suddenly move the technology in a way that commercial developers would never think about doing. Now, the other interesting thing about playing with VR is that how the human brain actually works. And some scientists in 2014 won the Nobel Prize because they realized that, or they actually did a lot of research, that the human brain has place and building recognition brain cells, that this is the sole job of these brain cells, and that the brain actually has grid memory brain cells. So we literally place in our brains or have in our brains these grids and places located on them. As they've continued with this research, they've also found that memories, emotional moments are connected to these place and building brain cells. Um, heights of ceilings affect creativity. So if you put people in rooms and your ceilings are 10 to 12 feet high, they will feel and be more creative than people who are engaging in eight foot ceiling, which is fascinating. And my favorite was studying New London taxi cab drivers. They literally, after they finished training, they found that their hippocampi were larger. So the brain is always remapping itself. Some of these cab drivers were in their 40s. So there's no seeming age limit when the brain will stops rewiring its circuitry, especially as it deals with location. The other interesting thing about this research is with memories connected to place and building uh, brain cells is that the reason that a new space feels empty is that it's no longer triggering memories, which I think is quite fascinating. It also echoes uh, Simonides' trained memory system, the ancient Greek, who you'd put a place or imagine a building, and in each room, you'd put an object for something you wanted to remember, and to remember it, you'd move around the rooms. Now, Kevin Lynch has organized this mapping into paths, nodes, and landmarks. And again, I want to say the medieval uh, monks and artists and scribes were way ahead of us on this. They understood this. And we could look at the decorations, decorated initials, as landmarks. We can also look at how paths are created in a manuscript. And here's a path in the uh, Book of Kells. What they do where the lion sits is the text after the lion actually is the end of the line right after it. So that when somebody is reading this particular passage, they have to, at the lion, go back to the margin, start over again, then go up and then go through Nisi Is and then back down in their reading experience. This slows them down because they were trying to encourage meditation. The lion is working as a node per se because it represents five different attributes of Christ. So suddenly it gives the opportunity for somebody to actually sit and contemplate this passage through five different attributes of Christ. The other way that they generated different paths through a text is through line sight. So you can see the eyes, I don't know if my uh, pointer comes through on the PowerPoint, but the peacock at the bottom is looking up at the little beast inside of the E. Uh, the beast inside of the E is to align uh, ego sum pontus, and it's Christ saying, I am the bread of the world. And then dropping down, we have a way of kind of connecting those two verses. 
So suddenly we have place that is manifested in our manuscripts itself. So when we're thinking about VR, we can think about doing things like the Enlightenment collection, the thinking collection of the Renaissance period. And I love the Hunterian collection at the University of Glasgow. It's a fabulous collection. But suddenly we're walking between things, making connections, and we're exercising our mind in really interesting ways and inviting juxtapositions. We can do that same thing in VR, and this is a very simple uh, version of this. And we've got a beast uh, on a Pictish stone carving from Orkney that echoes uh, an image of a beast in the St. Chad Gospels. Now I want to kind of end with thinking about the importance of the play of life. And I want to argue, and I've actually talked about this in many, many places that manuscripts, especially illuminated manuscripts, were all about the play of life, whether it's pigments or even the inks and the vellum. And here, I just wanted to pull out a few quotes about the Hagia Sophia, the temple uh, in Istanbul. And you'll notice when uh, Procopius is describing it, he talks about not lighted by the sun from without, but rays are produced within. So there's a sense that there's an inner light coming through. Uh, it's also suspended from a heavy, uh, from as if from heaven by the fabled golden chain. And that sense of gold and the light of God, the wisdom of God. We also have Paul the Silentarian uh, who is describing the Hagia Sophia as well. And you'll notice how much time he talks about the glittering marble, the glittering crocus like golden stone, golden light, glittering black, glint of precious metal, vivid green, not unlike emerald, snow next to flashes of black. So light is very important in that it echoes a sense of divine wisdom and divine grace. And the religious artifacts are viewed as emula emulating this. Now, in the um, lightning rounds, Beth Fisher has a wonderful video. I'll, I'll invite you to, to look because it's, it's absolutely fabulous. But here's another one. Um, Alan Williamson is currently working on developing a WebGL app that can show a page is uh, gilding and its reflection of light. So let me just play this very quickly. So you can get a sense of what his work is doing. And here again, it's a way of translating that experience of wonder into the current moment and it actually is a celebration of these manuscripts. And one of the reasons why we love these manuscripts so dearly, um, because as we engage with them, our sensory experience is very dynamic and our methods uh, and how that light plays off of them was seriously thought about by our the scribes and artists. And I think Beth's work is wonderful where she's even looking at how gold leaf will reflect light in multiple directions at once to give you that richness of experience. Now, in my book, Digitizing Medieval Manuscripts, I've got a chapter on VR, and I talk about it as knowledge spaces. But as I keep working in VR, I've been thinking about things like books, Web 2.0 manuscripts as transformational spaces. They really don't just transmit knowledge, they're transmitting transformative experience. And I think thinking about, and I will challenge people to kind of try to think about the spaces of books and manuscripts, VR, Web 2.0, or web interfaces as transformational experiences, how they're acting upon human beings and inviting them to literally transform themselves in their knowing. I think that opens up 
opportunities for us to think about how a transformational space of a manuscript is translated into a transformational space of VR. And I think that can lead us to some interesting and exciting places. Uh, thank you. And here are just some of my collaborators. I'm really fortunate that the University of Oklahoma Libraries has developed a wonderful, robust VR environment called Google. Uh, and you can actually download it off of the web or GitHub if you like. Uh, my work has been so dependent upon the generosity of Litchfield Cathedral. Uh, I can't say enough about them. And I've also had great support from the College of Arts and Sciences at Oklahoma with my traveling two-person uh, VR workstation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Bill. Um, now I'm just incredibly curious to experience a manuscript in virtual reality. So I'm gonna have to try that out. Um, so I think we have uh, a little bit of time for a few questions. We'll run over a few minutes, but I think that's okay. Um, so uh, please put your questions in the chat and Nick will um, call on you. Any questions for Bill or uh, uh, any of our presenters? Um, so we have a yeah, just a, a few minutes. Uh, we have a question from uh, Amanda Licastro. Hi, Bill. It's so great to see you again. I think you checked was the last time that we played with VR together. Um, I'm glad to see this project continuing. Um, and I am wondering if you could help talk us through the ways in which a manuscript could be used um, both for translation and transcription purposes, but also for contextualizing the manuscript. So how could you make, you know, radiant textuality in the virtual space, including, um, you know, sound, um, other artifacts, um, annotations in the digital space and things of that nature? Ah, great question. Yes. Um, one thing that we could do is just thinking about the Hunterian collection is thinking about a, what would a thinking collection look like for an illuminated manuscript? And we could pull in pages from other manuscripts. We can pull in metalwork. And by looking at those together, those may move us forward into an understanding we wouldn't have otherwise. We can also juxtapose post-process images in a number of different ways. We can have an ultraviolet next to an infrared. We can have a, you know, a, a yellow wavelength, but then we can also do post-processing and recover text by using alternative color spaces. So we can just be looking at an image that just gives us patterns of hue, which many times we can see things that we can't otherwise. The other thing is you, you blow it up so large that I can see better in VR than I can blowing up large on my screen at times. Part of that is context because I always keep track of where my, my placement is on the page. And one of the things that I've learned works very well, and I think figuring out what works well in VR is, is just gonna be an experimental thing. But I learned that I could do transcription very quickly in VR in about half the time, because I can have an RGB image I can have uh, an infrared, a post-processed image, and an ultraviolet. And I can just move back and forth very quickly. And these images are as big as the sides of buildings. So I see the whole thing by just moving my head around. On a screen when I blow something up large, I don't know if I'm on line four, line six, line eight. But in VR, I never lose track of that. Also, I can use my hand pointers, which uh, hand controllers, which have a little laser on them. So I can point and keep my place that way if I need to. But because of the topology of the page has these arcs and valleys, I have markers that always let me know where I am along with the illuminated manuscript pages, or excuse me, decorations as well, and decorated initials. 
So one of the things that I've found that is really dynamic is translation, because I can just record me saying the letters, and then I put the recording of letters to uh, a voice recognition, and I've got my transcript, and I can just check it. Uh, I'm much more accurate that way, and OCR does a really accurate way, or, or is very accurate. It's like 99.99 something when I've tried it, if you say letters versus words, uh, there's just no confusion. So it's really quite, that's a quite dynamic way of doing it. Uh, if we're talking about the light and we're doing interpretive work, understanding that reflective light is very important. And there's a, a, a ceremony in Rome and in Rome, they use four illuminated manuscripts, moving them around, turn to different pages. It would be very interesting to recreate that in VR and understand that ceremony from watching those movement of those manuscripts. So a lot of, I think, very dynamic uh, possibilities that are gonna take some serious time exploring. Thank you so much. I, I love that uh, idea of recreating the ritual around the object. Um, and also my Oculus Quest 2 just arrived and it's absolutely amazing in terms of ha haptic feedback and the, and the reality of your hands in the space. So they're $299, grab yourself one and we can chat. <laughs> okay, yes, let's chat. <laughs> Great, I, I think we have time for uh, one more question. We have a question from Beth uh, Fisher, um, who um, says there's too much background noise. So I'll, I'll read out the question. Um, so she asks, I'm, I'm curious whether you've considered any AR possibilities uh, or, uh, or only VR. AR has lots of limitations, but it's also easy for people to load on a phone without extra apps or equipment. It certainly does have a different spatial relationship, uh, but proprioception and scale would be possible. Uh, yes, I am. We were currently working on some AR. Uh, my first instinct is AR translations of what we're doing with VR uh, for the library. But once COVID hit, we kind of hit kind of a difficulty in trying to sort that out. But I think that AR, uh, you know, has some amazing possibilities both in supplying information, but we were playing with having a 3D object and we can actually raise that 3D object and magnify it in really interesting ways on a phone. Uh, we can also then turn it uh, and suddenly give an experience that is more vibrant. One of the things with just the human eye is it sees better if something is moving. Nothing is worse than for the eye to try to look at something that is still. So by having just a little bit of movement, and we see this in the, um, the technique of filming, where instead of just having a picture, a still picture, don't bring it forward or move it back a little bit so that there's slight movement. Because the eye uh, it's will actually start, some of its sensors will shut off if it's just looking at the same image time again. So we were playing a little bit with trying to figure out how to get movement um, in AR, but we kind of got interrupted with it. But I think that there's just some fabulous possibilities uh, that are open for AR. And in some ways, something like AR may ultimately turn out to be more valuable than VR. If I can have a really detailed uh, AR and maybe something with glasses that I can go into uh, an archive with my notes about a manuscript and questions or pages and images and suddenly have that projected next to the manuscript. Or if I wanna compare the St. Chad Gospels with the Lindus Farn, and I can project an image in the archive of a page of a manuscript from another manuscript and juxtapose them right there and then. That's a pretty dynamic and magnificent thing to be able to do. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I think we'll, we'll stop there. Um, it's 1210. 
Um, I want to give a very big thanks to all our presenters this morning, Alicia, Kim, Johanna, and Bill for a fantastic morning session. Um, and we'll be um, back here at two o'clock for uh, the discussion panel in the afternoon where we'll have reactions um, to this morning's sessions from Dot Porter, Bridget Weirty, and Eric Quackle. Um, I also want to mention that Lynn um, uh, Ransom, as in the past two days, um, will be um, running the lightning rounds, uh, lightning round videos during the break. So if you'd like to stay on and watch those, you're more than welcome. Um, and we look forward to seeing you back here at two o'clock Eastern time. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs>